are you, man? Hey, man, I'm doing all right. How you doing? Good, good. Are you um Are you watching the play in right now? Uh, I was, I was, <laughs> um, but I've switched off. <laughs> have you switched off because you're a professional and you're committed to uh, coming and talk to me, or have you switched off because there's about a 25 point difference with? No, uh, no. If it was a close game, I wouldn't be professional right now. <laughs> I'd be pretending that I wasn't watching the play in. <laughs> You'd be texting, going, "Dude, um, yeah, I'm nearly home. There's just been a held up. I'm in a meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come I'm, on. I'm five I'm minutes away, man." Fuck, I'm just trying five to get minutes away. five minutes, five minutes away. Yeah, How are there's a T-Rex, there's a T-Rex on the highway, man. I, I, <laughs> um, I'm good, I'm good. It's nice to meet you. I think probably most importantly, I say good morning and hello and how are you? But um, I can see by following your Twitter feed and having looked through, you're a huge basketball fan. So the most yeah. important question of the of the show today is what do you yeah. think of the new play-in uh, situation and what they've done for the last couple of seasons? I love it. Yeah, I love what is that? I love I love the player because it makes basketball matter for longer, and it makes more teams care about the end of the season. Yeah, you know, and and it makes the end of the season far more interesting. You're not you're not just thinking about you know the jostle for the end of the season isn't just about um, uh, home court advantage. It's also about trying to get into the play in, um, and and getting into the playoffs because like what a what a magical thing they've done to make, um, to give you a chance to make the playoffs if you're the tenth seed. You know, this, yeah. you, you're the tenth seed and you still have something to fight for. That's yeah. that makes that's made the, the the regular season and the end of the regular season so much more interesting. I didn't think I'd be care. I didn't think I'd care about the Pelicans, but I, you know, I'm about to watch the. But you know, once once we're done here and uh, 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 once yeah, I put so- the kids to bed. We got to wrap up. No, 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 no. I, I, I much get... prefer watching NBA games after the fact, anyway, so I can yeah. fast forward the everything. So I don't, know. don't worry it's about the, it. But um, yeah, as lunatics. I was just having a look in the background as well. I yeah. think I, 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 I set something up, and then I realized it had been five minutes, and the ads were still playing. And because yeah. it's ESPN, all the ads are ESPN ads. So and they're all like... the same ads that you saw yeah. the last <laughs> ad break. Yeah, that's lunatic. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I mean, I want to talk about all sorts of stuff, mm. uh, especially uh, the the show that you made and created and started yes. at the start of this year. But even yeah. within that show, mm. I think the promo talks about you. You know, and I played a bit of basketball. It's obviously a big yeah. part of your life. It's something you love. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. What is huge, it, what huge... it, and you're a good player. I mean, how's the skill set for you? Or you're more of a fan? Uh, no, I mean, I like. I'm not. I wasn't incredible. Like, um. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd ever go. I don't think I ever had the skill set or the size or the quickness or the athleticism to go pro. Um, but I played reps my whole life. Nice. I played representative basketball my whole life. Um, you know, I was the best player on my high school team for a large chunk of time. Not that's not saying much. We were we weren't the best high school basketball team. We came the best we ever did was like twelfth at nationals. Nice. So. We were okay. We weren't great. Um, won a national title at the under nineteen level. Um, playing for Canterbury, I played for Canterbury in the, at the under nineteen level. Nice. Won wow. There you go. Title. So I, I played like I played relatively high level basketball. Quite like you know, there was a point in my life where I was contemplating: Do I give everything I have to basketball and try and be the eleventh man on like some roster in like Japan or something? You yeah. know, like. I did contemplate that, but at the end of the day, I was like, if I chase that life, I'm going to be, I'm going to be no better than the ninth or 10th man on these pro teams. And I'm going to be going from contract to contract, making $40,000 a year, Yeah, right. maybe if that. And, and so I just, I just gave, I didn't give up my love for basketball, but I gave up that, that, um, intention to really give it everything. Um, and, and yeah, I became a comedian instead. And now I'm very wealthy, Pat. I'm very wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that LeBron has damaged his uh, uh, claim to the GOAT status by finishing 17 games under 500 with the Lakers this year? Because yeah, the reason I ask that is because that would have never happened to a Jordan team. No, a Jordan team would always make the playoffs, even yeah. if they, you know, even if they had, even if there were other issues that they were dealing with or whatever, you know, like when, when Jordan came back from baseball. You know, he, they were, but they had speed wobbles and and all a bunch of stuff. But he, they would always make the playoffs. Yeah, I think it has damaged. I, I don't think LeBron is the goat, and I don't think he ever will be the goat. But I think I I have this theory that there are two goats. 
two goats for two separate categories. Michael Jordan is the goat for all things basketball on the court. Yep. Yep. If you're talking about between the lines, yep. Michael Jordan is the goat. Yep. If you're talking about the greatest basketball player to one be a once in a generational top three talent, but at the same time having an impact and his actions having an implication on the world outside of basketball, yep. then LeBron is the goat of that. It's it's the it's the wider than bigger than basketball goat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and you know, he you know, he 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 that whole idea of more than an athlete and all that kind of stuff. Like, so I do want to give LeBron his props in that sense that he is a goat in in a different category, I think. I mean, it's, I really am interested in how you say that because mm. if you're going to start to like bring into the picture of the, let's say, the greatest person, the greatest human amongst basketball players, straight mm. away I think about the writings and stuff I read of people like Kareem Abdul Jabbar, what he's done after his career and the, and yep. the social commentary and that that he's added to his CV. We're, yeah. We're putting him in that kind of category of, you know, greatest human being to play basketball yeah. as opposed to greatest yeah. basketball player. Yeah, yeah, totally. And but yeah, like it's interesting because I I still think in this weird category of like, wh what have you done outside of basketball? Weirdly, in my head, you still have to be incredible at basketball as well, or else you don't quite fit into that category. And Kareem is Kareem is like incredible at basketball, but I do think that in the other category, the on court category, yeah, between the lines category, LeBron is second in my mind. Yeah. Right. So to yeah, be, I, to... I was I was gonna say I, my 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 era of basketball as I was a teenager, my later teenage years and into university yeah. in the nineties. Yeah. So the Bulls were everything. And people yeah. forget or they don't realize they talk about Michael Jordan winning three championships and three championships. Mm -hmm. If you actually have a look at when he was between the lines, he actually won six in a row where yeah. he played a full yeah. season. He came yeah, back yeah. after baseball and played a half he season. Only, it's you know, only three and three minute. because he went away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, I'm bored of this now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go be shit at a different sport for a bit. And everyone was like, oh, my God, it's our chance. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then he came back and everyone was like, damn it. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's that's completely true. It is six in a row, really, technically. Yeah. The six in a row where he played the full season is what he yes. won. Yeah. Um, what about what about now? Because I tell you something, and I'm gonna I'll, mm. I'll, this will probably get me bumped off YouTube, but I'll do it anyway. Yeah. As someone who I've discovered of more recent times, who I'm quite excited about is uh, mm. Ja Morant. I think Ja yeah. Morant is probably my favorite basketball player in the world right now. And this highlight from this alley from this year yeah. is yeah. one of my favorite 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 pieces of yeah. uh, basketball uh, in, in the world. How high he gets there, I'm just yeah, like, what? The, this I've person... never seen someone in mid alley -oop do this. So that the yeah. rim doesn't hit their head, and he's six two, like he's yeah. not a he's not a big dude. Um, yeah. so so I'm as an old fart kind of a yeah. fan of the nineties, early two thousands. You know, yeah. I'm uh, that was my era. Um, I'm I've I've discovered Ja Morant, and I'm going. I'm like, this dude is is something out of this world. He's I love incredible. him. The you know, he's, he, he's become a player for me that mm. I will watch the game if he's in it. You know, you have those kind of yep. actors in the world that yep. I'll watch the movie if you're in it. He's one of these, I will watch the game if you're yep. in it. It's a bit like Jesse Ryder with cricket. If Jesse yep. Ryder was opening, I would watch because you never knew what was going to happen. There was something yeah, exciting yeah, and yeah, amazing yeah, yeah, about yeah. them. Yeah, John Morant, John Morant's unbelievable. Um, and you know what's really interesting about John Morant is that not only is he incredible and also like um, – new age and and exciting to watch but i feel like he's got an old soul you reckon uh yeah he's a, he's got an old soul he, you know if you hear him talk if you hear him talk about the game if you hear him talk about his teammates he feels like the way he talks honestly he feels like a 90s player um he feels like he belongs in that era in terms of like who he is as a person gotcha. and he's so mature and he's he, he, like he's so stable and and level-headed He's just a cool guy, man, and like, and also, like you say, incredible to watch. Yeah, it's just one of the. It's it's, it's like because again, the goat situation. I heard it might have been it might have been Chuck and Shaq talking the other day yeah. about yeah. the difference between the greatest player yeah. and the and, and the like the best skill set. Yes. Like Jordan seems to be like I mean I idolized Jordan through the nineties, mm. but mm. when I saw Save the Last Dance or the Last Dance, whatever it was called, I'm like mm. Save the Last Dance. <laughs> the Last Dance. <laughs> the Last Dance. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm like you. You impress me more now as an athlete, but I think yeah. this should be as a human being. Like I, oh, I yeah. now realize I wouldn't want to be your mate. 
but I can still idolize yeah, what yeah, you yeah, yeah. but I wouldn't want to be your mate. Whereas you hear, like you're saying about LeBron, it's like these people who are either the greatest player or then mm. there's also the greatest skill set. Mm. So the greatest skill set might not necessarily have, like guys like Russell Westbrook, don't look at this mm. this year, but mm. the overall skill set or Ja Morant. And then you've got, mm. as you're saying, the greatest human to play basketball mm. as well. It's all mm. sorts of different mm. categories. Mm, mm, mm. But what's interesting is that LeBron on the, <clears throat> in terms of just between the lines, LeBron is second for me. Yeah, he's he's unbelievable, but just not quite there with with Jordan. But then if you go to the other category, Jordan is like quite low on the list, because, and that's not because that's not any fault of his. Like, I don't I don't consider him a worse person because of that. But he, that was his choice. He made that choice to just be. I'm a basketball player. I'm yep. not going to engage in social rhetoric. I'm not yep. going to be political. And that, and you know what? You can't fault someone for making that choice. That's your life decision. But that does mean that in that world of like, what impact did you make on the world other than other than birthing the most influential basketball brand of all time? Yep. But in terms of like social impact, what did you do? You didn't really do anything. But at the end of the day, we have we make choices as humans, and that's the choice he made. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's that. There's a famous quote from Jordan talking about getting involved in politics, and he said, "But Republicans yeah. buy sneakers too." It's like, my God, you made your you made your choice. And look, but yeah, before, yeah, yeah. before we get off basketball, because I yeah. mentioned Russell Westbrook, I tweeted mm. the other day something like, "You know, no matter what you say about Russell Westbrook's year, there are people yeah. who are probably tuned off already." So basketball mm. people know what we're talking about; the rest don't. Yeah. But no yeah. matter what you think of Russell Westbrook's year, this is what I tweeted out. You yeah. cannot argue that there is a moment that happened this year of the few that will last and that will last forever. There is yeah. one highlight. Oh no! Season, I, I don't think you. Oh, bro, Pat, I don't think you understand that this hurts my heart. Okay, I'm sorry. You know why? Look at this! 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 Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> but what I was going to say is, no matter how good or bad a year he had, well, bad a year yeah. he had. There is one moment with Russell Westbrook that will be one yes. of the highlights of the year for the next 50 years. Like, it'll be the one of the things that replayed just, against just that terrible man. team from Utah. And let's just have oh, a look. You, at you bastard. <laughs> let's have a look. Here we go. We might have put some sound on. Oh. 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 No matter what you think of him as a player, that, that moment will be one of the ones when you get the highlights of the years in 20 years' time that will play from this year. And I would argue that Ja Morant only might be in there as well. Can I can I say something about Gobert getting dunked on? Please do, because we're going to watch it again. Talk. Right. Oh. Ah. Oh. <laughs> that hurts me in my loins, oh. man. I think I'm I th – it hurts me in my balls. Like, I think I'm <laughs> infertile. I think I'm infertile now. <laughs> I think I've lost my ability to make children because oh. of that highlight. Um. Mm. I want to say about Rudy Gobert. Yep. Rudy Gobert will never play Ole defense. Meaning, there are a lot of big men out there who have the skill set that Rudy Gobert has. There are a lot of big men out there that are seven foot like him, have the same wingspan, have the same mobility, but they do not put up historic defensive numbers like Rudy Gobert does. Yeah. Why? Because Rudy Gobert will challenge every shot. But that means... That when a once in a generational athlete comes at you, you might get dunked on like that. Because Hassan Whiteside, who plays on the same team as Rudy Gobert, has the same specs as Rudy Gobert. Yeah, but he didn't. He didn't set records defensively. It's because Rudy Gobert says, "I'm going to try and block everything," but you might get yammed on. It's a, it's not the same because it's not the same skill set. But it might be before your time. But there was a player called Sean Bradley. Who I was the, the skinniest, tallest yep. white dude? Looked yeah, like yeah, yeah. Look, literally like he was made of pipe cleaners. Yeah, and everyone talks about him like he's a he was a terrible player. And every yeah. highlight there ever is is him getting dunked on. But what they don't show is all the times he actually got up and blocked the shot. He was yeah. pretty effective when it came to uh, to blocks to blocking. But yeah. that's never really a highlight unless you're unless you're LeBron or Ja Morant and you do a double handed block chase against down the block. Yeah, 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 yeah. But other than that, because you know. You know, 20 years later, you don't see all the effective defense that was played in the block. Yeah. All you see is the massive dunk over him. People think less of him. Yeah, but he yeah. was always up for the defense, like you're saying. No, no one's no one's going to look at defensive PER in 10 years' time. You know, like, no one's looking at these, like, deep cut stats that, <laughs> that Rudy Gobert excels at. Because they're not, yeah, it's not interesting.
you're talking about the the, the who like all well, I was talking about you answered because it, yeah. you know, that's how it works. Um, about the greatest, the goat. Um, there's a, a a guy I watch on YouTube called Jimmy High Roller, and yeah. he's got fantastic he's a real stats and data guy like yeah, he goes yeah. into pages and pages and pages of data and brings that information mm. i'm trying to get him on the podcast because what i want to say to him is i want to give him a, a challenge to put forward the greatest team of all times now what i mean by that is if you had five all-star top like russ what russell westbrook is a scorer his role in the lakers shouldn't have been scoring it should have been mm. distributing you know mm. to actually get out say the top 30 greatest players maybe you've got five of them in each position but then manipulate the teams to go actually john stockton would be really good to be with the score because he's better mm. at delivering the board to like like alan iverson wouldn't be so got quite so good maybe mm. with um with with jordan because they're both the scorers and actually find out what the what the best team would look like mm. not necessarily all top five players maybe someone's a 20th ranked player but he's by far and away the best assists person mm. in the game mm. And see what those teams look like. I'd be really interested to figure that out. So, Jimmy, if you're watching, which you're not, that's what I want to do with you. That'd be fascinating. Yeah, yeah, he's amazing, Jimmy High Roller. You should look him up if you if you don't know of him. But he's he's got some really interesting, interesting, interesting videos. Hey, um, mm. we probably shouldn't just spend the whole time talking basketball, which I could do. <laughs> if you wanted to, um, because I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I was just looking at you. Oh, and thank I, you. Forgive, forgive me for 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 losing it or losing it mm. out of my my adult brain. But there was a group of you guys when you were young comedians that used to make a podcast where you'd all sit around and offer opinions. What was the name Frickin of Freaking Dangerous, bro. We were, we, our group was called Freaking Dangerous, bro. Yeah. And our podcast was, was called, called our podcast was called The Issues Podcast. That's it, The Issues. Yeah. One of the greatest things I've ever heard. I, oh, I, that's, thank you, that's, man. So that's where I discovered all you guys. And, yeah. and watching, hearing some of you. And then watching some of you go through seven days and yeah. all that kind of stuff has been just yeah. a joy to watch and watch oh, where you've gone from there. Oh, that's so very yeah. kind of you. Yeah, no, but it was that great. Was, um, it was great. Yeah, that's 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 really awesome to hear. That was one of those things where we just, you know, like nowadays, nowadays, um, creating content and putting yourself out on the internet um, is very normal now. You know, like it's so normal and and so commonly done and um it's something that almost is like an imperative now if you want to have a career in comedy or a career in entertainment or whatever like it seems nowadays it seems like an imperative but we were making our podcast right on that cusp of like not everyone does this and yeah. it, and it feels like a really big scary undertaking and um and it, well, I, like the fact that you listen to it is amazing because it wasn't by normal standards it wasn't successful but you know that depends on how you measure success because we had fun and 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 we 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 sharpened our comedic skills and we did all these things so you know if you view success in a different way then it was successful but by numbers it wasn't successful but um it was a really the, the thing about that is it was a really exciting time because yeah. it felt new and weird and scary. And and there was that energy that you can't, I don't think you can capture anymore because it's just so expected and so normal that you either have a podcast or you create TikTok content or, you know, you do all that kind of stuff. Um, and even though there is an ocean of content out there, I still think the good content still rises to the top and the stuff that isn't crafted or isn't, or the people that execute things without caring about the craft still kind of falls away. Um, but that was a really interesting and like fun time. That was a it long was, time ago. That was like eight years ago. It was really interesting though, bro. I, I really enjoyed it. And just the idea, of, I would be the kind of thing that I would, you know, wait for it to come out and tune in for eight oh, years ago. So awesome. you're, you're talking 24, 2012, 2014? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we would have started it in like 20. Yeah, because I started my comedy career in 2011. I probably met the boys in 2012. Okay. And then we probably started at the end of 2012, beginning of 2013. Um, it's, so funny to think, it's so funny to think how I came across it, but I actually have no idea. Probably just looking for New Zealand content. But, yeah. you know, I was making podcasts with Jeremy Elwood at the time. And Were you? Yeah. Yeah, me and Jeremy, oh. we, we did our first podcasting together in 2008, I think, which is wow. an ele election series of podcasts called The Slightly Correct Political Show. And we did Incredible. that the following election season, which would have been 2011. Yeah. And then, because my background is in radio primarily. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah, really yeah. I left radio and left that world and sort of in the last, well, I've been doing this now since 2018. So this is episode yeah. 200 and 
four Amazing. years. Amazing. And I and it's just it's it's there's pros and cons. It's lovely, as you say, just to have that independence and to kind of just have that vibe of whatever we want mm. to do. Mm. Um, the paycheck for working for a mainstream media organization is more fun. Um, <laughs> but the creativity <laughs> yeah. and the freedom. I mean, like I yeah. this, this studio is in my house. You know, I've mm. managed to build a studio and it's got multiple cameras and multiple mics mm. and multiple sets mm. and all that kind mm. of stuff. Mm. And just the ability to be able to go, this is what we're doing now. This is mm. what I want to do, and I'll do it when I want, how I want. Uh, is is amazing. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like, like I said, like, we never had the huge numbers to be able to do the podcast, you know, forever and, and make money from it. And it became, you know, a thing. But um, that ability to just walk into, you know, like we bought some cheap mics from, from Wish and like all, you know, all that, all the stuff we're just trying to cobble together. You know, you're at the beginning of your career, yep. you have no money. And you're just trying to cobble together the things that that allow you to execute this thing, and then you execute it however you want. It was like there was just that like special energy that isn't the same when you like get hired to host a TV show. That's still fun, and that still has its like really enjoyable elements. And you know, there's something special about um, making something that has real production value behind it. But to be able to just sit around your coffee table or around your dining table, one of your mates, and just try and get good at this random new thing that like you don't really know what it is yet it was really exciting and I, and i think like you're saying the cream rises to the top i think you can actually literally still do exactly what you've described like yeah. yes i'm sitting in a studio with a decent mic and yada 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 but you look at people like mark maron i know mm. i'm sure his actual recording equipment is top end but he still does it in his garage mm. you know he doesn't use any video he has people mm. coming to his house and, you know, including people like President Obama and sitting in mm. his garage and doing a podcast. So I think if you've got good content, you can still do that. You don't need to yeah. go on the path that most people have gone to become a part of a bigger organization in a hundred thousand yeah. dollar studio. Yeah. You really don't. Yeah. And that, I mean, it's a little bit like I've always said about, um, you know, like television and video. I'd rather watch, you know, the, the, the greatest movie ever made in SD or in, mm. or, or offered, you know, a VHS from the nineties. Mm. than some pile of shit that's 8k with all yeah, the yeah, best yeah. You, know, you know i'd rather watch the quality storyline on a bad vhs than a, a amazing graphics but an absolute pile of shit when it comes to narrative and story that's such a great way to put it man that's such a great way to put it i'm a, I, I love video games i'm a big video game nerd and there's been this huge um renaissance and like resurgence of um of developers creating games that uh harken back to like 80s and 90s games yeah, and you think you know, like there. Are, I also love games that have amazing graphics and are like jaw dropping, you know, games in terms of their visuals. But the popularity of these old school games just kind of indicates that at the end of the day, your game do, can look like shit. But if it has beautiful gameplay, if it has interesting mechanics, if it has an interesting story, even if you're reading that story in text, if it has an interesting story and all those elements, yeah. People will like it because yeah. because people gravitate to quality and and something that actually engages you on a meaningful level, rather than like you know like shit that looks cool lasts for seconds. Um, yeah, and I feel the same about comedy as well. I feel the same about comedy in that like the quality lives for a long time. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one, eh? Because comedy evolves and changes and stuff as well. I'm a like I'm 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 a huge fan of comedy. Yeah. Uh, like I I'm I'm a, I I consider myself to have quite a a vast experience with comedy and following people and watching people and yeah you know listen to and I and I'm the kind yeah. of person and I use this example a lot. Like mm -hmm. I love uh, there was an interview between uh, Daily Show when John Stewart was on it and Al Gore. And, you know, at that time, John Stewart was like almost a beacon in the world as to giving accurate news out to the population mm -hmm. through comedy. And he actually said to Al Gore, you know, what, what the fuck is going on here? What, you know, why are we saying these things and why isn't the net news networks? And, and Al Gore said really, really, really bluntly, you know, in medieval times, it was the jester who was the only person, the only person was the jester that could speak truth to the king without fear of yeah. being the on. So yeah. comedians have a huge role to play yeah. in the narrative of our, of our society. And that's why it's so important. Mm. And I'm such a strong proponent of uh, the idea of joking about what they want, 
you know, mm. not necessarily being an absolute prick for the sake of being a prick, but if there's mm. a reason and a narrative and a thing to tell mm. a story, then comedians are the ones that are on the knife edge um, mm. in society. And it's so important that we don't get to a place where, um, you know, we follow that theme of only you can say this and only you can say that because that will be detrimental to all of society, in my opinion. Yeah, it's really interesting because, like, um, what's interesting about that is that to have the ability to do that, to have the ability to speak about things that might seem dicey or that might feel, you know, on the knife edge for a lot of people, and to, to have the, the ability to do that effectively, be funny, be intelligent about it, have a point, um, have an interesting angle, like all those elements that come together to make a good joke or a good observation, that takes time. Yeah, yeah. And it takes you committing to the craft to get to that point where you can now do that. And that, like, that's that, that kind of relates to that idea of the cream rises to the top because, you know, we, we live in an age now where, like, you can become a famous comedian in weeks. Yeah. Because if you hit some funny videos online and you go to like 80,000 followers or 20,000 or whatever, now you're considered a, technically, you're a famous comedian. Yeah. You know, yeah. by technical standards, you're a famous comedian. But do you have, is your ability commensurate with the platform you have now? Completely. That's, that's the really interesting question. And, that's why I'm a really huge proponent of organic growth. I'm not someone who who thinks that like you know there's this whole thing of like you need to you need to grind it out at the open mics for 15 years before you should get any opportunity. I'm not one of those like old school comics that that thinks that way. But I do believe in in this idea that like you your career and you will benefit far more if you if your ability is commensurate with the opportunities that come to you, because right. when they come to you, you will have the ability to execute them in a way that actually has an implication on the world around you and your career. But there's this, there's this, and I think it's one, it's the environment of, of getting famous quick, but also it's, and I'm not talking about the younger generation. My own generation suffers from this as well. It's that idea of wanting to be famous fast. We live in a very, you know, a, a, a society that wants speed in terms of like where you want to get to in life. And that's like fair. That's fine. Like that's happened before. Eddie Murphy did Delirious when he was 19. Like that has happened. But um, but that those are special cases. In most yeah. cases, I'm one yeah. of them. I'm one of the people who if I got a comedy special at 19, I would have flubbed it. I'm one of the people that I'm really, really, really grateful that I grew organically and the opportunities came and I know in myself that I have the ability to, to hit this out the park. And that was part of the podcast. You know, the podcast was part of that. The podcast was part of that organic growth to build the skills I need. Um, I'm not sure about this. Maybe he was 20. I thought he was 22 when he got delirious, but that, I could be wrong with uh, that. He could, could be younger. I, but, yeah, but he, he, he might have got SNL when he was 19. But, but yeah, either that, way... You, I, you could be right, yeah. But but either way, um, I've heard comedians. I follow a lot of comedian podcasts out of the states, yeah. in particular, also out of the mm -hmm. UK. I've yeah. heard comedians who are doing like sets and and Netflix special stuff at the moment. Going, can you fucking imagine doing this at twenty two? Like the guys who are in their forties and stuff now, they're they're at the 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 pinnacle of the career, yeah. the goats, yeah. if you will, of the current era. Going, how the fuck did he do that when he was twenty two? And un it's unfathomable. And, and it being so good, so good. Yeah, it's just yeah, it is it is it is like we were talking about once in a generational basketball players. He's he's a once in a generational com comedian. Like it's just unbelievable like to think to have that much command of a stage when there's that many people, you know, thousands of people in the theater and to look like you've been doing it for 10 years is just it gives me goosebumps when I think about it. You know, that's actually true. You've just said it in a really interesting way because you're right. People who don't know it, you have to go and watch Delirious. Although mm. you're talking about how uh, um, a joke and stuff ages, some of the stuff that are within mm. that content don't that hasn't aged very well, let's be honest. But that was the era and that was the, the comedy yeah. of the time. I mean, I don't think I don't think you can hold Eddie Murphy to that standard. No. Well, it is actually interesting that he hasn't been held accountable as well. 
mean, there are a lot of people who have said and tweeted and done similar things in the last 20 years who have been held accountable, but maybe because he was such a, it was such a genius set or a, such a genius production, he, he doesn't seem to have been. He seems to have been one of the people who, and I think rightfully so, gone, you know, those jokes today wouldn't really fly, but of the era was of the era. I think that's the key element. The key element is that there are a lot of other comedians who, who people have pointed the finger at and said, hey, man, you said some some bad shit in the past. And those comedians go, yeah, but I'm a comedian. I should be able to say whatever I want to say. Whereas Eddie goes, yes, I did say some bad shit. That was yeah. the error. I don't believe in it now. but And I, and I apologize for, for saying that stuff. But that's what we were saying back then. And I didn't know any better. Yeah, yeah. And for Eddie, the greatest of all time to humble himself and say, you're right but don't hold me to that standard is says a lot about who he is as a person as well for and, yeah. and i said he's the greatest of all time that that subject when it comes to comedy that's subjective but he is my greatest of all time nice. um um and and for him to be able to say that uh, says so much about his character um and and it's part of the reason why we go yeah you said some bad shit but you know what cool you've shown that you've grown and you're matured into the adult that you are and that's sweet mm. Do you, speaking of people who have um, erred in the past and then have mm. you know, had a different resurgence, do you have any personal feelings or thoughts around old Louis C.K. winning the Grammy this year? <sighs> yeah, it's interesting. I I think I feel weird about it. Okay. I feel I, I feel weird about it, but at the same time. I don't, yeah, I do, it, it, it's hard because Louis C.K. is one of those special cases, oh, not special cases, but he's that weird case where, like, he he, he did what Eddie Murphy did, and to be, to be fair, to be completely fair and, and, and clear about what I, what I say, Louis C.K., what Louis C.K. did was far worse than Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy was a 22-year-old young kid who was just... Yeah engaging in the rhetoric that everyone engages in right yep 100 percent. whereas eddie whereas louis ck did something far worse but louis ck didn't fight it and louis ck didn't try and plead his case he said you know i asked every person whether this could happen they said yes it could happen but i acknowledge the imbalance of power i acknowledge the fact that i abused my power yeah. and he acknowledged all these things and so i think there is an element of like Hey man, when someone shows that they're willing to learn and when someone shows that they're willing to admit that they're wrong, maybe we don't want to live in a society where we just we just demean and hold and and tear someone down until they have nothing left. Um regardless of whether they apologize and whether they're ready to learn or not. And and yes, what Louis CK did was quite bad and quite and 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 wrong, but th this you know, being able to, to to sit back and recognize that you did the wrong thing and say, I want to learn, goes a really, really long way and is really, really powerful. And I think that's something that our society needs to be built on, is this idea that, like, you can make mistakes and you can grow from it. If Louis C.K. was like, no, hey, hey, I asked every woman and every woman said yes, and so I shouldn't be crucified for this. This is bullshit. You know, like, if he came from that angle... I honestly don't think he would have won the Grammy. I don't. I do not think he would have won the Grammy, because because he would have he would have stepped on a completely different path as far as public perception is concerned. Yeah. What what he did do was say, I asked what I like what I said before. Yeah. yeah. I asked. Everyone said yes. I did abuse power, and and I did hurt women without realizing I was hurting women. I'm sorry. I'm gonna fuck off now. I'm yeah. out. I'm sorry. And I'm leaving, and I shouldn't be here. And he just and he just did his own thing, and he and he just put stuff out, and and that set him on a different path. The perception of him was different, you know. Um, but at the same time, I say all that, and at the same time, it, like a guy won a Grammy who jizzed in front of people. Like it's just like you can't <laughs> you can't get that out of your head. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. Um I feel like you need to play a clip from from your show shortly, but before I do, um, speaking about jizz outside of your head, um, yeah. um, it does raise the question for me though, yeah. about and I can give you an example actually from from me at a at a work do about people 
where's the space in society today for people to make mistakes? If what we're saying is people are making mistakes and they need to be able to come back from it, there does seem to be, and I'll say a feel amongst some aspect of society, not all, that if you make a mistake, they can come down on you quite quite hard. I, yeah. I did this thing when I was, it was like a team building experience when I was working yes. for a radio station in Tauranga. Yeah. Yeah. And the yeah. idea was there was four teams in the room in four corners of the room and there was four colored balls, right? Yeah. Yeah. like different colored balls, a pile of them. And the and the idea was you can steal from the, the group either side of you or you can mm. take from the bucket in the middle. And the idea was um, actually if everyone just took their one colored ball, then everyone would have the maximum amount of balls. Mm. But we didn't know that at the start. So we were running around mm. grabbing all of them. And mm. what happened was at some stage – someone figured it out. I can't remember who. And they were like saying, let's just, we'll just let, give us the green ones. You have the blue ones. And then someone else in the group didn't get it. And so they right. kept playing. They kept playing, trying to steal people's balls. Mm -hmm. And the group in general would like abuse this person. <laughs> it's like, this is what we've figured out. And I just thought, yeah. how can that person in this example actually then be in that workplace and make a mistake or, yeah. or not get the concept or not understand it and yeah. still be safe to do that without getting a torrent of abuse thrown yeah. at them. Yeah. Uh, you know, so what, how do we do that now when mm. where's the space for mistake? Sounds like a good blog with a space for mistake. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I, th I think that's like, you know, there's, there's obviously a, a line and like someone like Cosby, for example, like that, <laughs> that 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 line is crossed. Like he he didn't just walk over the line. He like friggin' Frosby flopped over the line and um <laughs> Frosby flopped. Yeah. And <laughs> oh, wait, is that no? That's not. Oh, that's high jump. No, <laughs> that's the wrong sport. <laughs> I was I trying like to think that. of the long jump. I was trying to think of long jump. Wrong sport. Um. Yeah, he went way over the line. And so that yeah, there are examples like that that are that are special. And like you just, hey man, you did something that is like unforgivable you you are completely conscious in your decisions in in this world in this way and that's unforgivable um but yeah there's it's interesting eh? it's like how 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 do we as a society kind of be more unified in our ability to be like this is a bad thing you did we all understand this is a bad thing you've apologized for it you you understand that it's a bad thing also yeah and we will give you the opportunity to learn and grow and become a better person so that not, that that this doesn't happen again, but also that you become an example of growth for other, you know, and for for other people that make mistakes as well. Um, it's part of the reason. That's one of the things that, you know, so many prison systems around the world are broken. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it's based in, in pure punishment. It's not based in retribution and 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 the ability to transform one's life and you know like i think this is on a societal level on a structural level things need to change so that the zeitgeist around mistake making changes as well you know yeah yeah, yeah. um you know the, the idea of prison is interesting as well because you think about what's for society yeah the i the ideal outcome for someone needing to go to prison for their crimes yes. is that when they get out they are a reformed human being and they don't yeah. reascend. That's the ideal. But mm. what you're saying is true. And in fact, I even remember Bill English talking about prisons of all the people, you know, from the, from the right in politics, talking mm. about prisons being a university for crime, people going in and learning more about crime and actually mm. not, not, not giving that person the chance to be a changed person when they come out. So, mm. so, so we have a, culture for want of a better word of not mm -hmm. doing that to people who need it most so of mm. course we're going to do it to the you know the the, the buff-headed young guy at the office who mm. says something inappropriate and abhorrent we're just gonna mm. go you're not going to be reformed we'll just fucking pile on we'll twitter pile on that real place mm. twitter mm -hmm. so i don't know i, I mean, also I, know. I also do think i also do think that there is an element of like i louis ck is a white guy yep. and i do think he benefits from that a little bit as well um, I think if a brown person made this mistake, I think it would be much harder to come back. Is it impossible to come back for that brown person? I would say no, it's not impossible. Yeah. But the journey to come back would be way harder. Um, just wondering, just wondering if we should use the term comeback when we're talking about Louis C.K.'s offense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry, but yeah, bad, bad use of words. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. No, that's fascinating as well. I mean, the yeah, the the historic um you know, uh, abuses of various minority groups and how that still plays 
into society today and, and how we treat and speak and what yeah. we expect. So yeah, that's, mm. I mean, it's an unanswerable question, but it's an interesting thought. Yeah. And like, you know, I, I, I've always believed that like when you're a minority group or when you're part of a minority group, whether, you know, you're brown or, or whatever it may be, and you you get given these opportunities, you have a much slimmer margin of error. Right. You know, if you, if you're a white dude, your margin of error is wider. So when you get those opportunities as a young brown person, you kind of have to be much more careful and kind of, and be ready to nail those opportunities. But that's also why I believe in this idea of organic growth. Because I, I want all these young brown comedians and performers that are growing. I want them to succeed. I want a world where brown comedians start stand up and they're not the only brown person in the green room for years and years and years and years that there are white comedians and brown comedians and, you know, like there's all the comedians there. That's what I want. But for that to happen, that group, that cohort of brown comedians have to start to rise up and become part of the, of that cohort of comedians that are successful and getting gigs and doing yeah. stand up, Right. But if you keep, if you don't allow yourself to be good enough to, to knock those opportunities out the park, you, you don't climb the ladder. Um, and 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 that and again that connects to that idea of that like slim margin of error. You got to get in there and do it well, or else you're out. And then the next person replaces you. Um, um, just to yeah. just to just to talk about what you just talked about because I want to say this like kind of publicly so people get it. That's it's really an addendum to what you're saying about the privilege yeah. thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I always talk about privilege is something that you haven't earned, um, yes. can't change. And get a benefit from. Yeah. So that's how I always think about privilege. So yes. when people say there's no such thing as white privilege, I go, horse shit. Yeah. Well, you got to have a look at various justice systems yeah. or how people are spoken about or yeah. people yeah. getting flatmates and looking at the at the at the picture on on yeah. on on uh, Facebook. And mm. if you're getting a, a if you're getting an advantage, yeah, through the color of your skin, i.e., nothing you've done to earn that, yeah. Um, then, then that's a, a privilege that other people don't get. Therefore, the, to even argue the fact that there's no such thing as white privilege, like I know some of the right wingers in America, are like, well, prove it. I'm like, yeah. well, just just have a look at the justice system and how I'm, I haven't done this research for a long time. But when I was working as a talkback host, I did a lot. How you know when when a when a when a, when a Pakeha and a Maori commit the same crime with the same background of offending, the Maori gets typically uh, sentenced to a harder time than the mm-hmm. like. There's no difference other yeah. than the color of their skin and the Pakeha will get less time than the Maori. It's like, if that's not a concrete example of yeah. white privilege, then what is? And, and I, uh, you know, I think a really important element of this conversation uh, is being able to recognize that white privilege absolutely exists. And white privilege is something that um, has existed for a really long time, but there's also like all there's there's so many different other privileges that lots of people can benefit from. Like, I recognize that I am also a child of, I'm brown, I'm the son of refugees, I'm, you know, a minority group in New Zealand, but also I am a recipient of privilege. My dad came to New Zealand with not a lot and worked really, really hard, and at a certain point started to reach financial success. Yeah. Like you say, I had nothing to do with that financial success, I didn't control it, I didn't earn it, but I am going to benefit from it, and I did benefit from it, you know? And so being able to like go, yes, white privilege exists, but even if you're not part of the, the the dominant white society, being able to look and go, there is privilege that I also benefit from that, that you know, uh, it could be financial privilege or geographic privilege in terms of like living, you know, in a space where you are the dominant society, whatever it may be. Um, and not to just, sometimes I'm I'm like, man, maybe we should start the rhetoric needs to get a little bit wider and not just be like white privilege white privilege white privilege because it is a thing but also there are other privileges and you need to be able to recognize them as well even if you're not white yeah look and i, and I think you're right i think that becomes then the balanced and intelligent conversation as to where, rather than the ideological yeah. conversation yeah. like for example i mean i mean other than like having an irish mum who fed me fucking meat and potatoes every day yeah. there's yeah. nothing i've really done to end up being six foot four and 150 kilos well the food yeah. eating is 150 kilos yeah. but yeah. certainly my frame and that kind of stuff and I realized not that long ago that even though I'm a I am a pussy when yeah. it comes to things like fighting and stuff, mm-hmm. like I've never been in a fight in my life, but I've also mm-hmm. never once in my life felt scared walking down a street. Like right. never, never yeah. once. Yeah. Now I, you could argue that there's been too many sticky buns for the weight, but certainly yeah. the height and the size and that kind of stuff. Yeah. 
there's, yeah. there's, I've done nothing for that. And I would see that as compared to a, a small, more vulnerable woman who yeah. feel scared often about yeah, what may yeah. or may not happen to them. I've, I've never experienced that. Yeah. And yeah. it's through nothing that I've really done or earned. It's just because of who I am with these Celtic, you know, genes <laughs> and some, and some height yeah. in my DNA. Really? Mm. You have size privilege. Yeah. Well, I mean, on some level, I mean, I also yeah. have the opposite because, you know, there is a, there is various terms around fat people that are, uh, they go, the yeah, other right. Way. But yeah, in general, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't rally against that. In yeah. general, it's something that I haven't really done that. I realize I've, uh, even if people, uh, people may irk at the word privilege, but yeah. I benefit from that versus someone who's more vulnerable and smaller, you know? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned being raised by refugees. What a fantastic yes. segue. It's almost like yeah. you've done this before. Um, and I said I was going to play a clip and I might play a couple of clips through the day, but you are yeah, talking yeah, about, about various things. Let's just have a look at, uh, and, and I'll be honest with you, I've only discovered this more recently, so I haven't really yeah. delved into your into the product yet. I'm yeah. really excited to, and I'll and I'll tell you why shortly. Let's just play this little clip. So yeah. this is um you wrote and you this is you playing your dad. I played my dad, yeah. And you look, I mean, surely I'm not the first one to say to say that doesn't look fucking anything like you. Like yeah, the the, the, the mustache and the longer hair, and are you yeah. wearing some kind of padding? It looks like there might be a little bit more, or is it just the no. way you're wearing your pants or something. It's no, I I put on that weight. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. And, have a, and, 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 and we'll have a look at a clip from your show, Raised by Refugees. Yeah. Yeah. We love this country. I came up on these streets. Welcome to the real world, folks. It's not a meritocracy. Wake up. Get with it. Be proud of your nipples. I have strong <laughs> Iranian nipples. As long as you treat people with respect, you will receive the same in return. Yo, what if you like? It's not like I peed in the bed, but my he was like warm custard. <laughs> I came up on these streets. Is talking about Sima. Oh, I thought we were talking about the yogurt I spilled the other day on the carpet. But then I covered it up with the rug. Yeah, I love that rug. Oh, don't look at me. He did a semen, remember? <laughs> <laughs> I'm um I'm not a huge television watcher like on mm. network television. And so on mm. some levels I've missed it. But when I started talking to you a few weeks ago about you know coming on, I was as 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 us interviewers all do. I'm wanting to do some research, and I found it. And I'm like, man, there was this there was this moment in the last twenty years, early two thousands, coming out of the UK, where there was things like Bend It Like Beckham and East Is yep. East and Slumdog Millionaires at the Kumars yep. at number forty two, and a style. And I'm not trying to pigeonhole you into one style of comedy, sure, but sure. a style of that sort of um, what the what the British refer to as Asian comedy, what we would more think is of the Indian or subcontinental mm. Uh, mm. comedy. That was so brilliant. And although I haven't delved enough into your product yet, but I see it all the way through it. And I'm mm -hmm. so excited to have found it and to oh, check it you, out. Man. Um, people you. are talking about it like everyone loves Chris, which for people who don't know is Chris. Everyone Rock. hates Chris. Everyone hates Chris. Well, I like yes. him. I mean, I mean yeah, 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 yeah. Will Smith hates Chris. I think that's what it's called now. That's his um, new show. That's his next show coming out. <laughs> where Chris Rock basically writes and produces his own story of him yes. as a child. Yeah. And it's what you've done about you being a child of refugees in yeah. the early Auckland 2000s in yeah. Auckland around yeah. when 9 11 happened. So tell us. I mean, I'm just excited to hear about it. Yeah. So, right, this show, like, it's interesting that you reference Chris Rock's show because that is the direct inspiration. Right. Cool. Everybody Hates Chris is the direct inspiration. It's the show that I loved, you know, growing up and in intermediate and, you know, the beginning years of high school. Um, and so I was sitting with my manager one day and we were eating noodles somewhere in Auckland and he, we were having a conversation about like next steps. And he goes, if you could, if you could make a TV show right now, what would it be? And I said, um, I'd want to do my version of everybody hates Chris. Wow. And, and, he, and he goes, that's amazing. We need to pitch that now. And so we, we pitched it to, uh, a production company that I trust um, called Kevin and Co and they loved it. And then we, and then we start, and then we, we wrote, we wrote some stuff, you know, we put a pilot together and, and a pitch document and we, and we got it made. We, we got it sold to sky and, um and we got it made. Um, So yeah, this is, this is like, it's, you know, this is the thing in, that I've done in my career that I'm most proud of so cool. far. 
I, I'd, I like to think that my career is far from done, but to this point in my career, this is the thing I'm the most proud of. And I'm not, it's not, not to say that I'm not proud of other things. I'm, I'm very proud of many other things that I've done, but this is a, this is, you know, I've never, I've never created a product that came from just constant work, like nonstop. Like they, you know, the, the period in which I was making the show and really going deep and, and crafting it, um, my wife and my children lost me. Like I wasn't there and I've never done that for a project before. I mean, I've worked hard creating stand up. I've worked, I've worked my ass off trying to get good at stand up and writing stand up and and other things, but this, um, yeah, I gave everything to. And so, to, for for the response to be overwhelmingly positive was like, it was an unbelievable feeling, because you know the the worst thing you want is that you give so much of your heart and soul for three years and then everyone's like, it's fine, <laughs> and you'd be like, shit, you know, like that would have been tough. But people don't say it's fine. People say it's good, which is. You know, you get to a point where you watch you because you're you wrote it, you're in it, you're deep in the post production process as well. You know, if, so you see, you I've saw every episode fifty times. I lost all perspective as to whether or not it was good. <laughs> I heard every joke over and over again, and by the end of it, I was like, "This is a piece of shit. This whole thing's a piece of shit. Like, throw it away." Because I just you you're so in it, you're so deep, you you can't. It's impossible to have real perspective. So and so, in all honesty, when we were when it was coming time for it to be released, I was so nervous. Yeah, because I didn't know what people were going to think. Um, but thankfully, and I'm really grateful that people like it. And look, I'm I'm not the kind of person that blows smoke, so I yeah. won't be going. I I haven't seen enough of it yet to think about. I'm but I tell you. Mm. I'm hugely excited about going to. Maybe we'll have to do an update podcast in a wee while, and and we'll do a little a little short addendum that I'll that I'll stick yeah. on to the end of this one. Yeah. But I'm hugely excited about seeing it. I'm also always excited about. And in New Zealand, we have a really bad history, and I and I don't know how you would classify this show for you. I was yeah. going to say a sitcom history. I don't know if you call it a sitcom. One. I don't know. I, I, I guess it, yeah, it's somewhat. Well, of, yeah, it's a sitcom kind of. Okay, but but short. Let's say a short form comedy television yep. program. We're, we're, we're pretty bad. We've been pretty bad historically at those scripted. Mm. I mean, mm. not amazing. Not saying I'm not, not casting shade on everyone. Mm. And it just really excites me that looking at this from the outside, looking at some of the reviews, seeing what mm. people are saying that it looks like it's going to be fucking great. And I'm mm. excited to see it. I'm also interested as to what it means. Like surely with the overwhelming response, have you been, have you been they call it earmarked, whatever picked up for another season? Is that being worked on at the moment? Uh, I can't, I can't talk about it extensively, okay. but, okay. What I can say is conversations are well underway. Yeah, that's what I because I also I also thought that because of the use of accents, yes, I want I'm like this might have more of an international feel than mm -hmm. other New Zealand productions, mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, platforms, Netflix, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. those sorts of things as well, because it's not just your classic Kiwi accent all the way mm -hmm. through. Yeah, you know, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. there is international accents within it. And yes. I and I and the UK is a perfect example. I mean, I don't know what streaming platforms are in the UK, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, again, you're probably going to say I can't say, but is yeah. there? I mean, is there any uptake from overseas? Is this going to be something that that people in the UK at some stage are going to see? I I can't I say, can't say <laughs> but what I can, but, <laughs> but what I can say, but what I can say is that yes, conversations ongoing. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, I'll go further than that and say okay. that. It, people in other countries are going to see the show. Cool. Yeah. I can't talk about who's going to buy it and what, but I will say that it is confirmed that other countries are going to see the show. Or don't all you need to do these days, isn't it? Don't you just send a pilot off to Rose Matafeo and she just puts it into the right <laughs> yeah, hand? Isn't, yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, that yeah, what yeah. we do she these days? The, she gives you the. And then <laughs> yeah, either you're in that. or you're out. She sees yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, she's doing amazingly overseas. Oh, are man. They, look, Rose is so talented. It's so exciting to hear someone for whatever line of work they're in going, this is the thing I'm most proud of. The th there's exciting for two reasons, right? Yeah. One is I know, and I don't know you personally, personally, but I, I, yeah. I've performed enough and been an hour, around enough performers that go, that I, that I know we are our own worst fucking critics. Yeah. Right. So if we love what we do, and I'm not saying we like I'm at your level of, of what you're performing, but people who are in front of cameras and microphones and whatever it is, if we love what we do, 
then nine times out of ten, I reckon it's a fucking stonker. Like I yeah. get off a podcast and I go, that was a really good podcast. I know that people are going to enjoy it. But the yeah. second thing that's most exciting about it is you are a young man. If this is the best thing you've ever done, imagine yeah. what next is going to be. And imagine when that becomes the best thing you've ever done. And imagine when the thing after that becomes the best thing you've ever done. And imagine what that means for you, your career, and your product in 20 yeah. years from now. It's or, so or imagine I've peaked and it's all downhill from here. Oh, you know it's not the case. Don't do that, you dick. Um, so, <laughs> Such so a there's Kiwi lot... thing to say as well, like. Such yeah. a Kiwi thing. Oh, say. nah. Yeah, nah. Yeah, nah. This will do. Yeah, yeah. nah. Nah, we're fine. No, no. I, I completely agree. Yeah, and that's why I say that, like, you know, it, to, in, in all honesty... This the this show feels like the marking or like the kind of line in the sand of the new of the new stage of my career. Great, you know, like the 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 experience I gained, the insights I learned, the the people that I've now spoken to because of the show. Like it feels like my career has stepped into a new phase, which is yeah. really really nerve wracking, but also like so inspiring and and exciting. So yeah, I I I do a joke about it being downhill, but the truth of my heart in my heart is that it's it's not and it's and uh, there are big things that i hope are coming that i'm very excited about yeah i was going to say obviously one would think that this will open other doors as well so yeah. you know you can't you can't talk about it but overseas people see this <laughs> then of course uh, the local festival the local comedy festival yeah. will yeah. want you to be you they want you to be there yeah. because yeah. this has yeah. been a huge hit on abc channel seven what, what are we saying we uh, no i'm just kidding um <laughs> <laughs> I, I am interested though to wrap up our conversation on some level, not that we have to wrap up, but is to talk about stand up and it's yeah. and it's kind of sense and where you're at with that. We've had two years of, you know, everybody hates COVID. Um mm. and and the world has kind of changed. Is that something yeah. like you, you talked about um Eddie Murphy and Eddie Murphy mm. did this delirious and then he did Raw mm. and then it's like see you later. And there was rumors pr prior to COVID that he was turning up in comedy clubs and perhaps coming back. That seems to have all gone to the back burner mm. because he got involved in other things there are other mm. guys where no matter what they do um they always come back to comedy like they, they mm. consider themselves comedians first mm. everything else is on the side i'm thinking about guys like bill burr you know he's always a stand-up comedian no matter if it's for family and whatever else he does it's mm. always mm. The, the first thing on his cv is comedian in mm. my mind anyway stand-up comedian mm. 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 What, what about you how does it all rate at the moment and what are you doing when it comes to stand-up comedy if anything I I, I'm I'm uh, I'm a comedian first. I'm a I'm a stand up first. Stand up is my first love. If you could let you know, if you could talk about it in those terms, it's the first thing I I fell in love with as far as the industry is concerned. It's what I witnessed when I was a when I was a young man and like was like holy shit, what is this? And and was fascinated by it. And at the end of the day, like you know that I. I don't do a lot of like social media videos and like content and all this other stuff. And like people like Chris Parker and Tom Sainsbury and, and those guys are so good at that stuff and have built this huge following on Instagram and stuff and more power to them. Like, I think it's amazing. And, and, and if that's what they love doing, then they should wholeheartedly do that. But that's not why I got into stand up. I got into yeah. stand up to be a stand up. Yeah. And right. that's what I love. Um, so yeah, like at the moment, my career feels like I'm doing a lot of television and I've made my own show and I'm going to be hosting. I'm, I'm a judge on, on, on a talent show, a family oriented talent show on, on TV too. But that all, like all of that, you know, I got to feed my family and pay my mortgage and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, my heart always is going to be drawn back to stand up. Like when the owner of the classic comedy club, when Scott emails me and goes, Hey man, do you want to do? uh 20 minutes on a on a thursday night that pays me 120 bucks it means nothing as far as like you know feeding my family it means nothing but i'll say yes i'll go do it and i know a lot of there's so many comedians in new zealand that have become successful on television and all these other places and i'm not and i'm not this is not a slight in any way that's just the decision they've made, but they've become successful on television and, and stuff and they have families and they have mortgages and all that kind of stuff. And then most of the stand up goes to the wayside. Yeah. Um, and I just can't do that. I just can't do that. I will always go do the random Thursday night gig at the classic, or I will always go in and, and that's because stand up is what, and I'm not saying these other people don't love stand up, but for me personally, I 
get antsy when I don't do stand up for a while. <laughs> you know, like I start to, you know, like I need to get on stage and like and say and say my ideas, you know? I need to t- sell, tell my ideas in a funny way to a room full of strangers and I don't know if that's healthy, it's probably not healthy, but it's just it's just the way I am. And All I'm right. going on I'm I'm probably going to be going on tour at the end of the year and uh like I, I'm unbelievably excited for that. I'm going to play would you rather with you for a second. Right okay. to see to yeah. see where you sit on There's only one question, and I it's not pre-prepared. I just jotted it down oh. while you were writing. Sure. So, um, it's not it's not your product, but you get invited yep. to work or host or judge on a television show here in New Zealand. Yep. Fucking big big fat payday, right? Yeah. Like a like a good big fat payday. Yeah. Or you get invited to go perform at the Fringe in Edinburgh, uh, you know, for a week. But it's probably let's be honest, going to cost you to do it. Yeah. Where do you where do you lean? Oh, he's paused. Oh, okay. Here's the thing, oh, man. <laughs> you know, I I talked, I said all, I talked all this smack about how much I love stand up, and now you put a big fat paycheck in front of me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is here's the thing. Here's how I'll answer the question. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna take the fat paycheck. Okay. Because I've 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 reached a point in my life where where a week at Edinburgh where I lose money is is in the rearview mirror now. Right. I have kids. I have a yep. mortgage. Like, if if this was and I got married at twenty one. Right. Say I didn't get married at twenty one. Say I'm twenty four years old. I yep. have no kids. I have no yep, mortgage. Single. You yep. asked me that question. Yep. And that was my situation. Yep. Oh no! Forget twenty four. Say I was thirty one. Say I'm the age I am now, but I had no kids and no mortgage and no marriage. And, yep. and was a single guy. And you asked me that question, I would have taken Edinburgh. Okay. But my life situation is different. And, and you know, my selfishness has implication on other people who are yeah, sure. seven and five years old. Um, <laughs> so, so it's different. It's different. Um, but if you were to say to me, if here's an interesting, here's a, a, a different way to frame it. If you were to say to me, you can be the host of this TV show that gives you a big fat paycheck. Or if you could go to LA and do a week at the at the comedy store, and the paycheck is not fat, but the paycheck is enough that it makes the trip there worth it. You like break you even come, at worst. Hey, you break even at worst, or come back. You break with a even sport. at worst. You break even, okay. or you come back home with like five hundred bucks. You know. Yep. yep. And you're not and you're not losing money. The opportunity to perform at the comedy store for a week or whatever that maybe even if it's the Laugh Factory in LA, I would take that. Like okay. that's a, I think that's a better comparison rather than like the grinding it out in Edinburgh and losing eight thousand dollars or ten thousand um, dollars <laughs> is is just not it's just not on the cards for me anymore. So is that? I mean, I would always think, and this is because it's not my world, that Edinburgh seems to be sort of a pinnacle for a lot of Kiwi comedians in particular, yeah. because yeah. it's probably that colonialism and that Commonwealth yeah. thing. But for you, is it would it be more, you know, going on after Bert Kreischer at the Comedy Store yep. in LA? Yep. Would that be more of a draw? Yep, big time. Big after Bert Kreischer, sorry, that means he's opening yeah. for you. Maybe you're before him, and he comes yeah. after you. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, um, it's definitely yeah. That's definitely the draw for me. I grew up on American comics. You're right. UK comics came later for me once I became a comic and became a student of the craft. I went back and I, you know, I did my homework and went back and started watching UK comics. And now I'm a big fan of of Dylan Moran and like these other UK comics that I've discovered in, in my adulthood. But as a kid, as a teenager, it was yep. all American comics. And that's what I grew up on. And so that that romantic relationship that a lot of Kiwi comics have with the UK and Edinburgh, I yep. have it with the LA and the New York, you know, underground comedy clubs and that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's an interesting thing where you've come from. I remember being a being a kid uh in the late 80s and hiding downstairs at a batch in north and listening to kevin bloody wilson santa claus you cunt where's me fucking bike and it, I, that word for word still sticks in there and also delirious i've probably seen delirious 30 times and, was, and, and like so much so that i can remember delirious and can't even really remember raw as much even though it was you know argu- arguably as good but there was something just so unique and groundbreaking about that first one and then after that martin lawrence came along and then after that you know and it kind of took off from there and uh, uh yeah love it love it to but and just can't get enough of Chappelle at the moment love Chappelle love his take on the world I know he's controversial to some but I'm like as a as a social commentator he to me for me at the moment current crop he's probably goat at the moment goat all time I don't know but at the moment for me it's like it's, I love it love it to bits oh we've lost you 
I think I hit, I hit my button by accident. We're back again. Hi. <laughs> hi. Hi. I hit my button. That's right. Um, yeah, I'm the same. I um, yeah, like I grew up on all of that stuff. And like I said, the first time I ever saw stand up was I was watching C4. Um, I th- I don't know if it was called C4 back then, but whatever Channel Four was, right? You know, back when I was like twelve years old, and um, everyone had gone to sleep, and I snuck out into the into the living room and turned on C4 because I knew that stuff would be on Channel Four that I wasn't allowed to watch, like <laughs> like ECW and um and and stand up that I didn't expect was going to be on, yeah. and Eddie Murphy was on Channel Four, and I watched it and was just like, yeah fell in love at that point delirious might have been the first stand-up i've seen i remember being a a kid at staying at someone's house like at a holiday mm. being mm. upstairs but they had like an open they had an open stairwell and we could hear mm. Mm. And, and 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 might not have aged that well for the reference now but mum and dad listening to bill cosby albums and mm. going whoa this is different and mm. then but but actually thinking as you said the first one you saw perhaps delirious was the first one i saw on VHS at some stage in the eighties, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, I've just realized as well, Pax, we're kindred, because if you have a look at our um if you have a look at our names here in the thing, like yes. P A T yeah. P A P A X, you're like the non binary gender version of me. I yeah. Think. <laughs> I'm the Latin X version of you. Yeah, the Latin X version of me. Are you is it Patrick or is it just Pat? Yeah, it's, I have I have several names, but my, my birth name is Patrick. And if you yeah. know me from when I was knee high. Like, yeah. so, you know, uncles and aunts and friends of my mum and dad. Um, yeah. I'm Patty. Right. Um, so, because that's the Irish coming out. If you don't know me very well, I'm Patrick. Like, if someone finds up looking for Patrick Britton and it's yeah, yeah. like an IRD or something. Yeah. And if yeah. you're a mate of mine, it's Pat. And um, right. yeah, no, my, my mother's maiden name was Mulligan. So, I literally could have been a Patty Mulligan. That's, that's, how, that's how deep the Irish blood goes in this. Ah, in this very in this, Irish. In this ginger giant. Yeah. <laughs> my, my full name is also, my, my full name is Pax Trick. Oh, there you go. <laughs> We're even then there together. Oh, it's not. <laughs> hey, it's been an absolute pleasure, Pax, to talk to you. And I, I love it when I kind of communicate with someone over a period of time. And sometimes it's years. Yeah. And eventually we get together and yeah. have fun having a chat. And yeah. I really enjoyed today. I really enjoyed hearing your perspective and your take on the world. And I just thank you for giving us some time today to no. come on the Department of Conversation and having a talk about all sorts of weird, weird and pointless shit, but stuff that some people, me in particular, find interesting. My pleasure, man. It was my pleasure.